we're excited to have them here today because, as I said before, in case you don't remember, um, their goal really is to help educate the staff, including children, about how to care about families, about family-centered care, what their specific needs and unique feelings are. And it's really been great for us, and so now they're getting out into the community because we're looking at EMS as, as partners in, in family-centered care as it is. So we have a couple different, I'll do a quick introduction and then you can kind of introduce. They're going to tell you their story. <laughs> And like I said before, how things work, things that work well, things that didn't work well, and what we can learn from. So the first mother we have is Mitzi. And I and I one thing I didn't say is, and correct me if I'm wrong, some are parents, some are patients. Correct? No, we're all parents. Are, you're all parents. We're all parents. Okay, the advisory council. Has the advisory patients. the family's faculty has patients on it as well. Teenage patients. Okay. So this is Mitzi Goldsmith, and she'll tell you a little bit about her story and her son Derek. And we have Jen Welday behind us. Uh, and Jen, you have triplets. I have triplets. And another son. Yes. So she'll tell you a little bit about that. We have Allison. Here comes Allison Kingsley and her husband Scott. And she brought her young man Brett. Say hello to Brett. You want to say hi? Hi. 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 And then the next, last but not least, is Ms. Noble. This is Hannah Noble. So they're all going to tell your story. So please welcome everybody. Thank you. Um, first, let me give you a rundown of what families faculty is. We are a bunch of parents and some um, older teenage patients at Children's Hospital. And our job is to inform staff and those that come through orientation what it's like to live with our children. Our children are not your everyday go off to soccer kids. We have very complex medical children and our lives are very different. So how we perceive things are different as well. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is the importance of an EMS program and a registration database for special needs kids. Um, we have one at Children's that we're trying to expand and what that means is um, I called Sherry said we need to meet they we got together we talked about my son and his medical needs we went out to the guys that would respond to my son so that they would learn about him um, because he's not the typical child so here in Ohio um, we're fortunate to have this database I don't know if you've already talked to Delaware and that their special needs database as well um, but here in Ohio, we're very fortunate to have a number of great pediatric hospitals. Uh, the southeast of Ohio does not have that many, and they have to do a lot of transportation for kids. And there are medically fragile children down there as well. And every second counts with these kids. Um, as most of you know, the pediatric continuing ed requirement uh, for recertification in Ohio is the EMS performance measures uh, six hours in a three-year cycle. Uh, intermediates need eight hours, paramedics need 12. Ohio does have a written EMS protocol for children, um, and it includes care for special needs children, but unfortunately these protocols are only recommendations. <laughs> and as a mom of a special needs child, that scares the hell out of me. <laughs> so the most important thing I can tell you is that children are not little adults. Um, without appropriate pediatric medical direction, a pre-hospital provider could underestimate the, pedi the pediatric patient's condition, make a medication dosing error, um, be incapable of effectively triaging the multiple pediatric patients. And let's face it, when you come into our houses, you probably go, oh crap, because you know it's like walking into a hot another hospital and it, it can be very overwhelming at times. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to my friends. They're gonna tell you some experiences that they've all had with EMS, things that went well, things that didn't go well, and kind of give you a perspective of what we're looking at. Now I have to unmicrophone myself, so this could be fun. So I'll turn this over to Jen. Here, I have a bunch of microphones. Okay. Here, we'll do this. It's easier. Do we the slides? Yes. Just once or twice? There's two. There's two in there. There we go. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Mitzi said, my name is Jen Welday. Uh, my husband Rob and I have four children. Um, James, James is, um, I don't know what I did. Okay, hold on a minute, because I'm not very technically savvy here. Here, I got it. 
Um, James is 15 and a half years old, and then we also have um, almost 14 year old triplets, Joey, Sarah, and Caleb. And the triplets are 26 week pre were 26 week preemies and had a variety of health issues um, due to their extreme prematurity. So Caleb spent seven months in the NICU and developed hydrocephalus after a grade three to four bilateral intraventricular hemorrhage when he was about three days old. Um, many VP shunt surgeries and revisions and a G-tube later, we brought Caleb home with many machines and medications. Caleb had been seizure, seizure free since leaving the NICU, but that reprieve ended one day in 2001. It was just after breakfast and I was getting ready um, to leave with the kids on a trip to Cincinnati Children's Medical Center for um, a feeding team assessment for Sarah and for Caleb. And the, I walked into the kids' room. Caleb was sitting on the floor, and he looked up to me, looked up at me, and I could tell immediately that there was something wrong. He looked like his face was short-circuiting. I asked him if he was okay, and he said yes, which I thought that's a good thing, right? Because somebody told me along the way, if kids have a seizure, they won't be able to respond to you. Um, that was kind of uneasy still, so I called my mother, who happens to also be a nurse. She didn't answer because she was on her way to help me go on this trip. So, kind of. Um, hung around my house and waited for her to walk in the door. She's all smiles. I look at her and say, something's wrong with Caleb. So we hurry to his room where he's sitting on the floor. He looks up and says, hi, Grandma. But his face was twitching the entire time. She was sure it was a seizure. So we loaded the kids into the car to take him to the emergency room. We didn't get very far because this was rush hour traffic. So we thought our best bet was to turn around, go home, and call the squad. The call, to make that, the call to get the squad to the house was terrifying for me because I've never, I never had to have done that before, and plus it was for my child who was sick. The wailing siren kind of filled me with dread. I heard that, I knew they were coming for us, I knew there was something wrong. And the sight of these big burly EMS guys walking into my house kind of overwhelmed me, so I just like burst into tears. They were asking all sorts of questions and I was kind of useless. I was really happy that my mom was there. I would imagine that EMS personnel often have to deal with distraught or upset loved ones. But when you're responding to a situation that involves a child, perhaps the difference is that these mothers view these little people as part of ourselves. After living in a high stress alert mode for so long, this whole situation kind of threw me over the edge. A seizure, seizure was one of the things that I feared the most. Is it gonna stop? Is it gonna change Caleb? Will he still be able to crawl, to talk, to smile? We've come so far. What are we going to lose with this episode? The EMS crew was great. They talked me through everything that they were thinking and doing. As Caleb was being evaluated, I had time to collect myself. I refocused as they asked me direct questions about his health history and walked me through the events of that morning. I know my mind was jumbled, but one of the main feelings that I have, as I recall that morning, was calm which seems kind of strange, but I, they made me feel calm. When we were loaded into the ambulance and settled in for the trip to Children's, one of the guys asked me, are you okay, Mom? I admit I was a little embarrassed about how I had handled the situation. After all, I'd been through countless hospital stays, numerous surgeries, dealt with illnesses and medical conditions requiring lots of medications and specialized equipment. I was a pro at this special needs stuff, right? Never once was I made to feel inadequate or overly emotional, and for that I'm extremely grateful. Okay, so here's Caleb now. <laughs> That's like a first day of school thing. And I will hand it over. Changing of the guard. That's what it feels like. One. Hi, um, I'm Allison Kingsley, um, and I have part of our family here. Uh, my husband, Scott, and I are proud parents of three wonderful children. Our youngest child, Brett, was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy type 1. It is the most severe type of SMA. He was diagnosed at age 7 months and was not expected to live past the age of 2. He is currently 6 years old and living life to the fullest. Most SMA type 1 and type 2 children will eventually be placed on a ventilator. Brett received his trach and vent 
after a bout with RSV a little before his first birthday. It was then that we were introduced to the EMS program at Children's Hospital. The EMS coordinator at the time set up three visits from three different U EMS units to come to our house and get to know Brett and his equipment. I also spoiled them with a lot of homemade goodies. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, when one of the units came to visit, we were on our way down to Children's Hospital to be admitted. Therefore, only two of the three EMS units met Brett before we called 911. In the fall of 2010, Brett had major back surgery. He had his lower spine fused, two rods placed, and wiring to allow for growth. After five days, we were sent home on pain meds. A nurse supervisor at our nursing agency came for a post-op visit. She immediately changed the amount of paid med, pain med, the hydrocodone he was about to he was receiving. We started rotating him with Motrin between the two. She also consulted with the physician uh, about this change. She knew that the hydrocodone would dehydrate him, which eventually would cause his lungs to dry out and then cause music, mucus plugs. I had no idea about this, so I was very grateful that she did. Within two days, though, Brett started plugging, even after the change, and we had to call the squad. His oxygen saturation level was dropping too low for us to transport him. Guess who came to our house? The unit that didn't meet Brett. So, kind of bummed. But when they arrived, I started giving him information about what was occurring while also listening to the other medics, trying to figure out how we were going to transport him. Because usually he's, sometimes the vent is on a stand plugged into, you know, the little power circuit and everything. So when I was listening to them talk about that, I had to change my attention to um, the transport discussion. They were baffled and started talking about bagging him and taking the stand and everything else. And I immediately jumped in. And anybody who's on a vent would have a nurse or a parent with them at all times. So they will know how to break down the vent for transport. And obviously, he's not on the stand right now. So it's all broken down, and he's, he's mobile. Um, when he's on the stand, you'll see a little, little chamber filled with water. And that chamber acts as his nose. Since you get the trach in here, all the air is going directly in here, bypassing your nose, which is giving you the moisture to keep your lungs, you know, not dry, but moist. So when he's off that chamber, that humidification chamber, he has a hum event. So right now he has a little, little piece of plastic that kind of connects into his circuits. And that hum, hum event provides the moisture. The only downfall to that hum event is he can't have it on for a long period of time. So he will eventually dry out. And when we get home, we give him saline aerosols to get that moisture back into his lungs. So that's a big thing to know, <laughs> to know when you're transporting a child with, with a vent. Uh, and the last thing you would want to know is, um, that bagging would definitely be the last option. So if you can't break it down, then you would have to bag. Therefore, upon arrival to a patient on a vent, you should ask two key questions. First, is the ventilator set on a rate? That rate is how many breaths per minute is given to the child or the patient. Um, Brett, for instance, is on a rate of six during the day. So he automatically gets six breaths per minute which is actually pretty low. So he will breathe over that six breaths, obviously, on his own. And he'll have another 16 to 18 breaths on top of that. The second question you would want to ask is, can they breathe without the vent? Um, this will let you know if the person is vent dependent. Brett, for instance, can, br can breathe off the vent. So he will just get more labored if he's off the vent and eventually, um, you know, run into some issues. So bagging for a person that is, vent, is dependent on a vent is totally different than, than a person that is not dependent. Only one time have I seen Brett bag that he did not cry. 
bagging takes Brett's control takes his control away from him. Therefore, you have to work with him to assist in the breathing if you're bagging him. That would be accomplished by watching his uh, stomach. He's a diaphragm breather. And work with him and not against him. Other people, you might have to watch their um, throat sink and know that a breath is about to be taken and work with them. So, and then the, the vent dependent people, I don't think you would really have an issue with them because they're they're dependent on the vent or the bagging for every breath. Also, when transplanting a patient with a, with a vent, make sure to bring their portable battery. Depending on what vent they have, they might have one that's internal. We use lithium ion batteries. They're kind of like small. But the vent itself is only good for 45 minutes. Um, the internal battery on a LTV 950 or any of the LTVs. So depending on the vent, so just make sure you have a, a battery. Some are huge and they look like a car battery, but always make sure you have, have a battery. And the oxygen is also connected to the ventilator and transmitted through the circuit. So a face mask or nasal cannula will not work for a vent child. When Brett was being transported that um, fall day on a Friday afternoon, I was given additional information, giving a different, additional information that he had meds and so forth and giving that to the medic. But upon arrival to the hospital, we always know that we're going to be admitted. So it's very important to help advocate that the child needs to be switched over to a hospital vent as soon as possible for humidification and because they are on that external power source. Sometimes the stay in the emergency, emergency department can be hours and therefore the sooner the switch, the better. You don't want to see a kid dry out from that little hume event or have the battery die before they get switched. It's also happened, it also happened this day that the hospital did not hear me or receive the information that Brett was plugging and he was dehydrated. Therefore, the emergency department saw that he had a trach culture a few weeks before his surgery and put him on meds for a trach infection that he was already treated for. So if the communication could have got there from the EMS to the hospital, not too sure what happened there. But it wasn't until Monday when the, his pulmonologist was rounding and talked to me and so forth that we that he realized that he was being tr treated for something that was entirely different. So communication and trying to get that relayed is a huge help. And the parent will have a good indication of what is causing the problem before transported. transported. So make sure this helps, this gets relayed to the emergency department correctly. Last but not least, get to know the ch vent children in your area. Know their equipment and even ask how to learn to break down the vent. Parents are more than willing to teach you. And it's always nice to know the child while they're healthy instead of an emergency situation. So that's my key points. Oh, was I supposed to? There's two pictures. Oh, oh there we go. There's one of the EMS units that came to our house. It's going to be a hard act to follow. Sorry, I don't have uh, my little ones. My name's Donna Noble, and I have five children. I have a 18 year, almost 18 year old who has Asperger's, so I found the autism speech interesting. Um, we had a son, Kyle, who passed away five years ago. I'm going to talk a little bit about his our first encounter with EMS. Um, we have a four-year-old typical developing child, because God does have a sense of humor. We have a three-year-old who um, was a foster child that we adopted who was diagnosed with autism on the more severe end. And um, a two-and-a-half-year-old, almost three-year-old uh, little guy that we adopted who uh, has short bowel syndrome and is IV dependent um, and is currently listed for a small bowel transplant in Pittsburgh. So. Um, Every mom can tell you that their child is different. And you can have Jen has triplets, and she can tell you that all three of her triplets are different. 
Um, they're all going to react different ways to the same situation, and the same thing um, is when they're sick. And Jen has a uh, sentence in her speech that she does for family faculty, and she talks about Sarah's sick eyes. And so every parent knows what their child's Sarah's sick eyes are. So a mom can usually tell you, and most dads, I hope, can tell you that their child is sick before you're going to see outward signs of illness. So before the fever spike, before their other little things go off, they just have little quirky things that parents know. Um, and so it's very important for your EMS workers to know those signs, especially for your kids that have complex um, care issues. Unfortunately, we did not have the chance to introduce our EMS team um, to Kyle before they were needed in an emergent situation. And you have to remember, our son passed away five years ago, so this was about six years ago. Um, and a lot of the things um, that are set up now were not in place then. So our experience began when our little guy, Kyle, um, was under the care of the palliative care team at Children's Hospital for his mitochondrial disorder, and he started to crash. Um, we had been in constant contact with his primary doctor for hours in our home, um, trying to keep his blood pressure up to an acceptable level. Um, we finally and reluctantly accepted defeat, and I had to call an EMS to come pick up Kyle, uh, which for us was a big thing. Kyle at the time was five and a half and had probably spent at least half of his life inpatient, but we had always brought him into the hospital on our own. We had never um, called our EMS workers before. Um, little did we know that the loss of Kyle's legs two years previous would actually help keep him alive for a long period of time. Um, Kyle lost his legs to a septic shock episode two years previous to that. Kyle's mitochondrial disorder caused him to live with chronic low blood pressures and high lactate levels, which led to his ability to deal with levels that would normally incapacitate other people. Kyle could only compensate, though, for so long before he would crash and need extensive support to keep him alive. Little did we know that the adaptation by his body would hinder him receiving appropriate care during his first e interaction with our EMS workers. When the EMS arrived at our house, they were not familiar with Kyle or any of his equipment. As the other moms have talked about, we had extensive equipment. At that point, Kyle had IV five IV pumps running. Um, he had oxygen going. He was hooked up to a pulse ox monitor and to his blood pressure machine. Kyle's blood pressure was low with the alarms going off but he was responsive and somewhat talkative. The EMS workers weren't sure what they were supposed to be doing as he did not appear to be in any overt distress. I talked to them about his past struggles with um, maintaining a blood pressure and how usually after one of these episodes he ended up on pressers for several days. Um, they worked on getting Kyle flipped over to their equipment, but once again, they weren't familiar with our equipment. So we struggled with getting Kyle from his bed. He also didn't have any legs, and we have five machines and oxygen and all these other things attached to him. Um, we finally got him onto his bed, and to me, they didn't seem like they were any, in any hurry to get him out of the door, um, even though his blood pressure machine was still going off and his pulse ox was out of control. Um, finally, we were ready to go. Even though they had not done anything for him or to him except remove him from his bed in our downstairs bedroom to the, hot, to the gurney and into the squad. As we rode in the squad, they asked questions and Kyle dozed on and off. They did not hook him up to any monitors or anything. I was confused, but as a parent, even though I'm a strong advocate for my child, anytime you place a parent in a new situation, we tend not to know what to say and I didn't know the protocol. So even though I was confused, I was afraid to ask why they weren't at least monitoring him, checking his blood pressure while we were driving um, to the hospital. My anxiety level increased immensely when I heard them call him in as stable. Um, we ended up the short ride to the hospital with no intervention at all, just them asking me questions and they were doing whatever they were doing. When we arrived at the hospital, the EMS, oh, sorry, the EMS workers said that he was fine and he didn't need to be taken to a trauma bay, that we could just be taken to a regular exam room. We headed for a regular room with the nurse following in light, actually leading the way. We entered the room and the nurse immediately started to get a set of vitals on Kyle as the EMS workers were filling out their paperwork. This was the first blood pressure reading that had been taken on Kyle since the EMS arrived at our house 20 minutes earlier. EM Kyle's blood pressure was incredibly low and was setting off all the alarms. The nurse took his blood pressure to make sure it was a correct reading and then immediately screamed for help. 
She asked the EMS workers to help take, her, take him to the trauma bay. We were blessed that what could have been a fatal error resulted in no permanent damage. The EMS workers apologized to me while Kyle was being worked on. They thought he was stable as he was responsive and did not seem to be in any overt distress. I kindly reminded him that I had told him that he would compensate for such a great, he could compensate for such a good while and then he was just done. They stated that they had never seen anybody with that low of a blood pressure that was even remotely alert. Before they left, we agreed that when Kyle came home, we would meet to discuss what would happen if, when, we needed them again. The rest of the visit in the ER was a blur, but within 30 minutes, Kyle was on multiple pressors and other life-supporting medications and in his room in the ICU, which he stayed for the next week. We learned a valuable lesson that day, as did our EMS team. That baseline information for each child needs to be known by the team before they have to come out on a real call. Since Kyle was alert, they felt he was stable and no imminent danger, um, so they did not monitor him. Kyle was known for crashing quickly, and that first sign, and his first sign of rapid decline was a rapidly dropping blood pressure that did not respond to fluids. Um, thankfully, we had another six months with Kyle after that, and I think EMS was out at our house five or six times after that. Um, we never had any more issues um, with what he needed. We met with them before we left the hospital to come up with a plan and a team. And it, it's when you lose a child, you have to have some sort of sense of humor on it. So um, we developed a humor about it that Kyle had his standing protocol. They would call us in. They already knew from his primary doctor what medication he needed, and we seemed to always hit the same trauma bay with most of the time the same team in there with his standard cocktail of um, fluids, dopamine, antibiotics, and some um, other pressors and medication that he needed. So that's our experience. What could have been a very bad experience turned out to be um, a very powerful learning experience for our EMS team. They, we now, like I said, have a two-year-old who is listed for a transplant and has IVs, and they are familiar with him, so hopefully they'll never have to come out to our house, but if they do, they are well aware of his uh, medical needs. Do you want me to talk about autism real quick? Mm -hmm. Oops. 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 Okay, I'll hold it then. <laughs> so, as you can see, when you've got special needs kids, um, it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my son. I am the mother of five, and this is a very old picture because my three oldest are out of the house, and I will probably never get another family picture. Um, <laughs> but my youngest son, Derek, um, suffers from numerous disorders, including DeGeorge syndrome, Bernard Soulier syndrome, epilepsy, and mitochondrial disease. Um, I actually found out about the EMS program from Allison, and when the EMS come to our house, um, the hardest lesson to learn is that Derek is not normal. His baseline blood pressures are usually elevated. He's the opposite of Kyle. Um, and his normal body temp is like 96, 8, 97. So when we're at 99, 99, 8, we're in trouble. He also has a very high threshold of pain. We're actually in the hospital right now with a bowel obstruction that they've said he's probably had for a couple of weeks, but he didn't say anything until Sunday. Um, the biggest thing and the scariest thing is with mitochondrial disease is these kids crash and they crash fast. Um, one minute they will look perfectly fine, and the next second it's, it's downhill so fast, you, you're like, what the heck is going on? My nurses have experienced it and are just in awe of the fact that, well, he was just playing video games five minutes ago. So the standard protocol for him is to run a lot of fluids and run them fast, not what you would normally do. Derek, we open it up 250. Um, when we come to the hospital, they just open it up full bore and just flood him with it because that's what he requires. Um, I'm very familiar with his signs and symptoms, so I can, like they said, Sarah's eyes, I can look at him and go, okay, we got a problem going on here. And I may call them before he's even showing any signs. And until this program, I drove him myself because the process of explaining it to them when they come in the door and the crisis is happening was too difficult. 
to try and get 13 years of what's going on with this child into a 10 second conversation so that they could get him off to where he needs to go, it was just easier for me to transport. Now that he's more fragile, thank God we have this program so I can just call and they know what's going on. As technology gets more advanced and these children who normally would not have lived or died in the few weeks of life are able to live at home, we have to be prepared to provide the appropriate care for them, whether the child is on a vent or just be cognizant of how to treat the child with autism like we just talked about. Um, we have to know how to use the best resources there are, and that's usually the parents. Um, yes, we're going to freak out like Jen does, <laughs> but there are ways, you know, you guys come in with more than one person. You know, if, if one of you says, Okay, mom, let's, let's take a t few deep breaths. What, what can you tell me? You know, at our house, everything, we have a packet on the back of the door, everything you need to know, his meds and things like that are on the back of the door. So if I'm freaking out or if grandma's the one that's taking care of him, she doesn't know anything, just <laughs> but she can go there and point to the info on the door. Um, so we are very blessed to be living with these medically fragile children, um, our life, by no means is a walk in a park as you see, you know, Allison and her husband with Brett. It's, you know, it's a full-time job just getting them to places. But um, we look to you guys to help us to help them live those longer lives. So I strongly recommend if you don't have a special needs database that you get one started um, because there are a lot more kids out there than you think there are, and it's, it's going to save you when you walk in the door. Um, that's all we have. If you have any questions for any of us, we're very up to, up to talking. Yeah? How do, when the, the database is formed, how do the EMTs get the information prior to arriving, or do they get the information prior to arriving? I know at our, the way we do it is, um, so they've all had their lessons on Derek and they know what's going on. They have a, a notebook on him that's at the station that they take with them, and then they can call into the hospital, and if it's during hours when Sherry's there, she automatically starts telling them everything that they need to know and getting the hospital ready. And then the next presentation coming up, Bill DeFord is going to talk about exactly how that's set up if it does run to children, for example, if it's just countywide or citywide. So we're going to talk about that next on how to do it and okay, cool. how to answer your question. Any other questions? Got a lot of wealth of knowledge up here. <laughs> I think one of the biggest things I heard that we can do better is the communication. Each one of you, your story seems to boil down to communication between us and you and actually us listening better to you, to what, what you're telling us as parents. Like they listen to part of Allison's and, and, and um, part of Donna's, and both of them led that that people were not listening to you in the beginning. Or they were, but they just didn't hear it. They just didn't well, I think. I think it's hard to process when you look at these children and they're talking with you and you're looking at them going, what could possibly be wrong? Why are we making this call? But we know that, you know, a snap of a finger, it's going to go downhill fast. Or we've been, you know, with the technology that's out there, we keep our kids home a lot longer than a normal person would, you know. So these blood pressures are very, very low or very, very high, and we're treating them at home. I mean, a lot of us have, you know, a lot of medical equipment and drugs and medications that we try before we even call you guys. So, and that's important to know, because if we've given them something, you need to know so that you don't do it again or, you know, things like that. So communicating is by far the biggest Any other questions? All right, thanks guys.